Yeah, I think it's, uh, we can start. And if some people will join a bit later, I will uh, let them in. Okay. Perfect. Good stuff. Awesome. Let's do it. Thank you very much, Giuseppe. Uh, thank you all very much for making the time to be here. Uh, I hope that you're going to get a lot from this session. It's going to be uh, a little bit of an interactive session. Definitely going to be some information that I'm going to be uh, giving you and some tools and ideas. Uh, but definitely really want you to feel free to jump in either in the chat or um, with you know, questions out loud uh, if you have anything. And then definitely there'll be a particular bit at the end where we will start to look at how you might some, use some of the, the tools and ideas that we'll talk about in your own practice and your own sessions as well. Um, so I'm Terry, uh, Terry PS, my business is Untold Play. And I wanna share with you some of the things that have uh, happened to me, some of the things I've been able to draw from my learning and development journey really, um, which has been a journey which has led me uh, to a lot of things around games-based learning and uh, has taught me a lot about helping people learn using games-based learning. So I started working in L&D a little bit over 20 years ago and it's been a bit of a journey for me of working from uh, managing uh, in L&D and uh, in facilitating, but moving and specializing into design. And the more and more uh, learning experiences that I've designed, the more I've found myself returning again and again to games-based tools. Um, and that's because I found them to be really powerful and really effective. Um, but a lot of that time I spent kind of trying to analyze, because it's just how my brain works, um, as to kind of why they work and why they work, uh, why games work to engage people, why they're powerful, why lots of people play games, um, but also why they work in a learning context. And that's what's brought me to some of the, uh, the insights that I'm going to try and share today. Um, if we think about the power of games, it's almost become a little bit of a trope, just how much time and money gets invested in games. I think the latest projection that I saw was a little bit over a $300, $300 billion industry for 2026, uh, and that's uh, just the video games industry, never mind all the other kind of games that people play. Um, and if you look at time, for instance, so I uh, don't know how many of you may have uh, been addicted to Angry Birds at some point, it was a very popular mobile game, and at its height, uh, the number of daily hours that people spent playing this game if you put all of those hours uh, and stacked them up, uh, then they'd be the same about as the number of hours total spent building the Panama Canal. So that's a lot of time people spend every day on this one game. And they're returning to it, they're putting their time, their effort, uh, engaging with it. And there's something about that game and games in general that's making them do that. Um, so I think a lot of what I've, uh, you know, found and explored is about uh, trying to harness some of that power and some of that engagement. Um, but I want to see where you are on some of that, actually. So it'd be really interesting to hear from you. Uh, so perhaps you could put some ideas in the chat and we could maybe talk a little bit about them. Um, what games have engaged you ever? Could be any time in your life. Could be recently. Could be when you were much younger. Uh, I've got a picture of a video gamer on the screen, but you don't have to think just video games. You could be thinking mobile games, board games. Uh, traditional kind of games, word games, playground games, uh, even little games that you play with yourself, like, you know, don't step on the crack as you walk along the street. Any game at all of any kind that's ever engaged you. Uh, so good stuff. Thank you, Kevin. Time well spent. Um, so board games, man. So, yeah, fantastic. Good to see about fellow board gamer. Uh, Wordle is a huge phenomenon recently. Uh, and there's, yeah, plenty of kind of blog articles. I've written one of them myself about why Wordle really engages people, but there's no doubt that it does. Um, SimCity, Grand Theft Auto V, Gavin, fantastic. Uh, Tetris, uh, Consequences, fantastic. Lots and lots of things. Um, Chess and Wordle, fantastic. Uh, Monopoly, Risk, Age of Empires, a computer game there, good stuff. Uh, so loads and loads of different things there. A lot of different kinds of games, which I think is really important, because you know, uh, if you look at those stats around kind of video games, particularly that can lead you in that one direction. But actually, if you start to look at some of the things that those games have got in common, whether we're talking about a really traditional board game like Monopoly, or a much more recent kind of thing, or a computer game, or, uh, you know, something that's a little bit um, more of a, just a traditional game that grows up as a kind of way that people play together, like consequences that Penny mentioned there. Um, these all have certain things in common. And what is it that they do? What can we learn from them, I think? To, uh, to say, okay, that's how people get engaged and also how people learn. And I'm going to talk in a second about the difference between those. So just in case you're wondering, oh, well, you know, it's fine for people to be, have fun with this stuff, but where, where does the learning come in? Um, but they, they keep coming. 
and we're maybe just going to uh, kind of come back to some of those uh, where, as we as we go through and talk about how they link into some of the principles that we're going to mention. Um, and code names, fancy, great, great call. I love code names, and that is one that I think really can be used quite nicely in a learning context. I might mention how later. So fantastic. Um, so keep some of those in mind. Think about why they engaged you, and to see if you can find some mirrors and some parallels and some of the things that we uh, are going to talk about. But I do think uh, you can start to say, okay, people spend a lot of time and money on these games, but what about the learning side of things? Uh, so I think if we start to think about what goes on in our brain when we are playing, when we're playing games, um, and we think about those phrases, engagement and learning, for me, it becomes a bit of a kind of double helix. They're kind of wrapped around each other like DNA. And you know, if the brain's doing one, it's kind of doing the other difficult to be engaged in something over a period of time without learning how to keep doing that thing and doing it better. That's how our brains work. We, we want to find out better ways to do it. Um, and we tend to get better through practice. And if we are learning, unless we're learning the really sludgy, trudgy, slow, gray way, um, then we're engaged. Um, so we're doing both those things and they come along together. The only real question for me becomes about whether the skill that you're learning while you're playing a game or while you're doing something that's game-like is it a transferable skill? Um, so if it's a transferable skill, if it's the skill you want in the learning context, then uh, games you know, are a great way to engage people and get them engaged. So this kind of observation uh, got me thinking and trying to break down how it was that games got people engaged um, and made them learn how to do whatever it was they were trying to do, even if it was just shooting angry birds, um, what, how it got them thinking about how to do it better. Um, and this brought me to the tool that I'm going to present to you, which kind of I, I created just from, from, from some of those observations and then developed over time, uh, which I call the six levers of games-based learning. And if you think about this levers analogy just for a moment, um, it was Archimedes who said, uh, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it and I'll move the world. Um, and with apologies for representing learners as a rock, um, I think we can absolutely do that with our learners. We can definitely uh, think about how we can move them using games-based learning, using all the things that games do well. How can we use them to move learners in the direction that we want? And in fact, our fulcrum, if we use that analogy, um, for these six levers of game-based learning that I'm going to talk about here, are, is this sentence, this kind of stub, which we're going we're gonna to end in a variety of different ways. So it's when we use games and learning, we what is it that we do what are we what are we actually doing that engages learners and helps them to learn how to do whatever it is they're doing better um so i think there are six things that we do when we use games and learning and i talk a little bit about each one give you a few ideas of why i think it works uh, and an example of it in practice um and some tips about how we could uh, how we could maybe use it in your own practice so do definitely think about your own kind of and i know it's talking to a couple of you uh, just at the start people talking about wanting to use games more in what you do. Um, so definitely have a think about um, the things that you work with, the learning experiences you're involved with, and whether some of these could uh, could lever your learners. Um, so the first of these six levers for me is uh, put the learner at the center. That's what games do. Games put the person at the center, and learning games put the learner at the center of things. So it's the difference between being a spectator like this i um, not 100% sure whether that photograph is actually in black and white or gray. I don't think it would make a lot of difference. Um, but you know, that's how it can feel sometimes, that spectator type learning. And the difference between being that and being the protagonist, being at the center of things, feeling engaged because it's happening to you. Uh, and so an example that I want to give of this, so that actually it's a, it's a really good example of all of the six levers at work, I think, um, is a game that I played a few months ago, uh, a learning game. Uh, about finance, about business finance, called Visible Value. So this is uh, run by a co company called Profitability. I just played it as a player. I don't have anything to do with profit profitability. Um, but I was really blown away by how good this game was at getting these concepts across because I hate finance. Is anyone else with me? Let me know in the, in the, uh, in the, in the chat if you're the same. A few hands up there. Yeah, I, I can't stand business finance, profit and loss sheets, balance sheets. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and so I attended this session because I thought, okay, maybe this, the games-based approach, will be a good way for me to learn it. And it absolutely was. Uh, so it took me, somebody who really doesn't like this stuff, and it 
put me in the center, put me in a team. So this is, how, this is what happens to you if you play this game. You place in a team, you have full control over how you approach the game's challenges. And these challenges are all about, you have a proper visibility goal, you get feedback on performance. Um, your team can decide which stock you try to get each round. So you're just kind of buying stock and then uh, selling it on a market. You can just decide things around how much to spend on that. And you're playing against other teams. So sometimes, you know, it's a competitive marketplace. They might get the stock you want at first. You might miss out, you know, maybe you made the wrong choice. But then you learn a lesson from that. You can take that lesson into the next round. Um, and you're doing, while you're doing all of that, or as part of it, you're doing some of the basic tasks. So you're filling out your own balance sheets and profit and losses, the kind of thing that if I had to do it in a normal lecture-based session, would absolutely bore me to tears. But now because I'm invested, because I'm actually, you know, I made these decisions, I want to see how they turned out and how they stack up, suddenly it's bringing it to life. Um, and all of the kinds of choices, you know, you can opt to take a loan out, but it's got to be paid back. Is it worth it? Um, lots to check out, lots to explore, um, you know, lots of uh, notifications and prompts telling you when to do things and loads of new things getting added over time and gradually, which is, a, I think, something games can do really, really well. You can add new things into the mix as you progress. Um, so, yes, you know, I can, oh, fantastic. Steffi's in there already. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so, you know, I'd highly recommend that game to anybody who, who is interested in learning about that. But uh, the reason I, I bring it here isn't just to kind of recommend them. Uh, I'm not on a kind of commission or anything like that. Um, it's just really to illustrate this first principle as well as you might notice some of those other things that it does uh, illustrating some of the other principles we're going to talk about, but it's really put you at the center and it's all the more powerful because of that. Um, I mean, one thing I, I do usually try and say uh, when I talk about a game like this is that obviously this took a lot of development time and cost for the organization to put together. Um, and I really, really don't think, I'm really happy to discuss this a bit more later, that you need to spend lots of money and this amount of time and this amount of technical expertise to do something with games-based learning. Um, but I wanted to give this as, as a really powerful example of it. So uh, that's uh, hopefully an example showing uh, putting the learner at center in this particular context. Um, and in terms of a tip actually for this one, uh, putting the learner at the center, the tip is do the other uh, five of the, of the levers of learning. So for these are the five um, we're just talking about, uh, and I'm gonna, gonna show you these now, letting learners explore, letting them fail sometimes, giving them meaningful choices, uh, nudging them towards the behaviors that we want to see, and setting them an open challenge. So they're the other five levers, but actually when you do those, you are putting the learner at the center, all different ways of putting the learner at the center. So, uh, and, and again, you might start to think about some of the games that you mentioned, even though some of them may not be learning games, but you know, all of those do put the learner at the center. You know, the Wii, uh, somebody mentioned that one, actually Lee mentioned the Wii console, you know, that I think got really popular because it's a different way to put you really physically at the center of what you're doing. Uh, and all of those other games, you know, you're the player, you're the protagonist. Um, so, uh, do feel free, by the way, as we're going through these, to, to mention any learning games that you think kind of chime into some of this. We'll, we'll come to that as a question for the whole group a little bit later on as well. But, um, you know, if you, you've given me examples of games that you're engaged with, uh, but if uh, they're kind of monopoly and, and so forth, but if you've come across learning games that fit with some of the things we talk about, it'd be great to see some of those pop up in the chat as well. Um, so, uh, that's putting the learner at the center. Second principle uh, is the second lever setting learners an open challenge. And you can see the open challenge right here in this, in this uh, image that I've chosen here. Um, as soon as she set eyes on the cookie jar, she's immediately thinking, okay, here's my challenge. How do I get the cookies? Um, and I think that is how learners often react when we set a challenge, when we set a goal, and when we give people resources with which to, read, which, with which to reach it, then at the very least, you've got their creativity, their creative juices at the very least flowing. And if you choose the goal and choose the resources well, then they're using all kinds of other skills and behaviors. And if you choose them uh, precisely, then they're gonna be using the kinds of skills and behaviors to solve that challenge, to reach that goal that are the, what we want from that learning experience. And I mean, you've heard this story before. This story is in a way, uh, the classic kind of bridge building, tower building kind of game or activity that you see in all kinds of different sessions. Um, and that in itself may be kind of quite a hackneyed idea just because it's been used so much, although still really effective. But its core concept 
is really sound. And I think for me, this is one of the, the easy ones to, to put into action and to put into action sometimes with very few resources and that very little time. Uh, so these that I'm just showing you on the screen here are some ideas that a group I worked with recently. So this is a group of trainers, uh, but they came up with this in a very short space of time, just from exploring a little bit the idea of setting learners an open challenge and then saying, okay, let's slide a topic in there. And let's think about, okay, if we had a topic, what could be the challenge? What could be the resources? And what could be the, the idea for an activity? And I'm not going to read through all of these for you. I'll let you kind of uh, source your eyes around the screen. But, you know, I think there's some great ones there around, uh, you know, some interesting topics. Telling stories with data, okay? Well, here's a story. Here's some resources. But you've got to actually tell the story. Um, or, you know, team culture challenge. Uh, okay, we've got to reform this culture. Here's what it is. Here's what we want it to be. Here's lots of information about that team, about day in the life of staff and different things. How are we going to, uh, you know, reform that culture? Um, so, you know, setting people a challenge uh, and asking them to use their resources. What uh, kind of, um, and, and in a way, you know, the how here is exactly the same as the why. Um, what is the goal and the resources? What's the combination of those things? that are going to prompt them to have to use the behavior or skill that you want the learning experience to be about. But as we saw on that previous slide, you can definitely think of some ideas uh, that can do that. Um, so let's, let's, let's go a little bit to you now and, and ask you, um, thinking about the games that you had already mentioned, uh, or thinking maybe a little bit about uh, any learning games that you've come across that you used. Have we seen this in action, this thing that games do well, setting learners an open challenge? Uh, feel free to open up verbally as well as in the chat. Really happy to hear from people. Interactive films created by Unit 9. That's an interesting one, Gavin. Do you want to tell me a little tiny bit about that? I don't think I've come across that. Not by name, anyway. Yeah, I'll have to pop on audio if you can hear me. Yep. Yeah, brilliant. So uh, Unit 9 I came across a few years ago. They've, uh, they've done two really big interactive films that I've seen. One of them is uh, it's a sensitive topic, but it's called Real Talk About Suicide. And uh, the scenario presents um, two flatmates living together. One of them is on his way out for a night out, a uh, bottle of wine in hand, and on his way out, he notices some unusual, strange behaviour from his flatmate. And that is the intro to, like, a multiple-choice branching scenario film where the, uh, the, the viewer, the user, uh, the player, in a way, um, has to, based on what, the, what the, the flatmate is saying, make decisions about what to say, what to ask, and then... The, the user, the learner, receives immediate feedback based on that, based on their, the response that they've chosen. Um, so I found that it's, it, it's not something that you'd normally associate I don't, with a game, but it's using those game-based elements, which is choice, decision, um, and then, you know, like response, but you get like points almost as, as feedback on there, aiming to, to get towards that goal that you're talking about there, which is... Um, to get to the point where the, the flatmate gets some help for his, uh, his suicidal ideation. And uh, just really briefly, uh, there's another one they created, which uh, I think it's called Lifesaver, where it's um, it's based on like CPR and people, uh, it's got, I think, three or four scenarios where somebody has some kind of, uh, sort of cardiac event, um, old people, young people, different situations, and then it guides the player, if you like, through the process of making those decisions, do you, rush to help or do you wait do you check for safety do you you know when do you apply sort of like chest compressions and those kind of things and even to the point where on on one of them it you get to use the keyboard so it's always like press k keys a and d um to simulate the chest compressions as well so uh yeah uh, unit nine uh, I'll, I'll share a link to their website in the chat it's i find it really effective Fantastic. Thank you, Gavin. I think Francesca may have already done so, uh, actually. But really quick with the links here today. Um, but yeah, no, really good. And definitely putting this learner at the center of things there, hugely. One of the later le uh, levers that we're going to cover very shortly uh, there about meaningful choices and really meaningful ones, it sounds like there. Uh, but definitely giving people a goal and some resources and expecting them to work out how to get to that goal. And throughout all of this, I really like to keep in mind that contrast between how's it going to feel to do that versus the standard kind of lecture model of, okay, here's how it should be done. Here's the principles, there you go. Uh, oh, a different game from Francesca, sorry, but uh, perhaps something on a similar theme, yeah. Fantastic. Good stuff. So again, keep them coming if you think of any other uh, ones that link in uh, and uh, yeah, all kinds of ones there. 
Nancy's mentioning a role academy training, team simulation game, how to use the new understanding of the processes and apply that to reach a certain outcome. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. So rather than here's a process, I mean, you know, what sounds more exciting than learning about a process, uh, you know, just by someone talking it through with you. But then, yeah, team simulation game, you know, try it out, see how it works and try and reach the outcome. Uh, excellent. Good stuff. Um, so we're going to have plenty more time uh, to, to kind of explore some of these. But yeah, uh, that's a few, I think, that will link quite nicely to this idea of goals uh, and setting an open challenge is the, is the principle there. Um, so another one here, I think, is to uh, let learners explore. Uh, and I've used the image of a map here because, you know, a map is just this open invite to explore. You're always wondering, OK, yeah, there's the kind of here be dragons over there. What's over there? I want to go over there. Um, and letting learners explore tends to work because it's fundamentally how we learn. How do we learn? We put things in our mouths when we're really small and we explore the world through the senses that are available to us. Uh, and we start engaging our evaluative brain. Um, you know, we, we're evaluating, is this something that's worth further exploration? Is this something that's not? And then we're prioritizing which things are worth that more exploration. Um, again, really, really good. To, I'm going to have to save this chat for sure. Um, so it's some really good stuff coming in there. Um, so in terms of an example of this, uh, what, again, you know, I, one of the great things about picking out examples for a session like this is, is picking out some of the things that have really kind of uh, wowed me uh, over the years. And one of those is uh, Minecraft uh, Education Edition's particular implementation of uh, We Are the Rangers, which is uh, instead of an ecology lecture, what students experience is the chance to explore in a 3D environment a wildlife reserve so they can wander around they can check out whatever part of it they want they can meet rangers they can see where the animals are they can see what habits the animals have um, and they start to encounter and solve problems like this part of the uh, the wider environment that's a port and where at this port pangolin trafficking is a problem so again rather than a lecture on the problems of trafficking the world, uh, of animal trafficking in the world uh, they get the chance to investigate what's going on and try and solve it, try and see if they can implement solutions to it. So straight away, you know, the exploration is leading to learning. Um, and I think if we're thinking about how, and again, I think that, you know, it's great to, to, to have these fantastic examples of it in action, um, but you're always thinking perhaps, well, okay, how can I implement it? Um, but I think the how there, you know, you can start to think, well, what can we allow them to explore? You know, could it be, um, a literal landscape or could it be a kind of metaphorical landscape the landscape of how you know our, our culture is or how uh, you know the, the world is in this particular aspect or just explore options available to them explore uh, physical locations or a map in any kind of sense uh, you know um, explore different tools and techniques so a kind of sandbox idea rather than uh, you know uh, telling them how to do stuff here yeah, play around with it see how you can explore it um, explore possibilities, what ifs, or creative possibilities, you know, what could we do with this, or how can we creatively reach this goal. Um, explore personalities, behaviors, people in a team, meet the team. Um, explore history, narratives, stories. Um, another example I sometimes give for this is that, you know, uh, history was another one of my uh, least favorite topics traditionally. Uh, I didn't used to listen much in history in school. Um, but then I found out about games like Civilization, and later on, Crusader Kings, which are games that have this really rich kind of historical context and you play through history. And that got me really, really interested in history and reading articles and uh, books on history. Um, so there's this idea to be able to explore and play around. Um, and again, really happy to, to invite, I, I, I won't kind of pause too much just to make sure we're, we're on a good time schedule, but um, if, you know, as we're going through each principle, do please, please feel free if you've got any Kind of examples where you think oh yeah i know where this is happening for me or i've seen this happening um so this principle we're talking about here let the learners explore let them have a go have a play move around choose their own uh you know what what uh, the equivalent of what the baby wants to put in its mouth um so that they can feel like again they're at the center of things so uh Next, we come on to well, the one that I think perhaps is where games really come into their own, perhaps most of all, um, which is to let learners fail. So in a game where you succeed first time, 100%, no problems, it's a bad game. You know? There are games where you expect to encounter obstacles, you expect to 
uh, have to spend some time working out how to deal with those obstacles and expect to kind of try, fail, hopefully fail better next time. That's an expectation for a game. Um, but in a training session or lots of traditional kind of learning experience, there's a kind of almost a, oh, maybe we shouldn't be failing. Maybe we need to be thinking about how we look. There's perhaps some of our colleagues here. We need to, to be a bit risk averse and, and not uh, show ourselves up to have a skills gap that perhaps we shouldn't have, this kind of thing. I don't know if any of you have encountered that in the training room. It's certainly something that I've come across where people are not feeling kind of safe. And I think that we have this kind of uh, potentially quite a precarious kind of balance leading from uh, if people have psychological safety uh, that they might come, for instance, if they're in an environment where they feel it is okay to fail because it's kind of expected, um, then they might admit that there's something to learn and they might well uh, admit that they need to experiment and try different things, take some risks. And that's, I think, where we get some of the best learning. But actually, as soon as they're feeling safe to say, yeah, I'll try it out, it might fail, that's okay, then we learn. We learn when we fail a lot more often than when we succeed. Um, I think one of the best moments for engagement and for learning for me is the moment of, aha, that didn't work, but I can see what's going to happen next time. I can see how I can fix this. Um, don't know if, uh, again, I'll just, in, just invite a little tiny bit here. Has anyone um, seen, played with any games that really given them that feeling? Really given them, ah, didn't quite get it there. But next time, I'm really going to figure out how to get it. I, I've got an idea now. I want to try it out. I want to go back in there and try this idea out. Could be a real life game, could be a learning game. Rubik's Cube, yeah, you get it in quite a kind of uh, gradual sense in Rubik's Cube, but absolutely, yeah, you get these moments of realization, I think, Penny, yeah, spot on. Um, yeah, learning to code, that's not something I have direct experience of, Piana, but um, I, I will take your word for it. I can imagine how that could be the case, yeah, absolutely. The stock market, yeah, how many extra goes you could have at the stock market, Julius, might depend on how deep your pockets are, but good, I like it. Um, learning to juggle, yeah, definitely, fantastic. And if we go back up to some of the ones at the top, we can probably see some there as well. Um, definitely, uh, I think Scrabble can be a bit like that when you kind of, uh, you know, realize that uh, how to use the different squares and maybe how to use some two letter words and things like that, if you really get into to it a little bit. Um, and yeah, definitely some of these computer games like Age of Empires, uh, Grand Theft Auto, you can be like, oh, I'm trying to finish this mission or get to this point. Didn't quite get there, but I can see what I did wrong. Uh, escape rooms is a great example for that, Hugo. Definitely, yeah, absolutely. Uh, good. And darts for a very literal example. That's so great. Good stuff. So you know, we can see where games do this to us, and they draw us back. Uh, they make us want to try it, and we're learning how to play a game. And again, remember what we said that the the learning context just needs to be the right one. You know, uh, they may not. We may not want to be developing the skills that playing the stock market uh, develops, or maybe we do. Um, but whatever those skills we do want to develop, we just need to find a game that is about them going through this process for that. Yeah, absolutely. Good stuff. So um, just the example that I wanted to bring in here, actually, is uh, a game called Culturally. I don't know if anybody's come across this game. It's a, a physical learning game that's sold as a learning game. Let me know in the chat if you have come across it. Um, I just this uh, little cartoon I'll kind of run it through because I think it explains really well how it's played and, and, and it helps you see a really great example of failure in action in learning. Um, and how it's played is you've got people on a team around a table. So you can see in that first frame there that they're kind of rolling a dice and they've got these tokens in the cups. And when you roll the dice, there are a set of rules about if it comes up on this face, you've got to do this action. And if you get the action, uh, if you get the action last, you lose some tokens. So everybody in your team, everyone on your table, you're all trying to do the right action when the dice uh, face comes up as quickly as possible. Uh, so you can see them there all putting their hands on their, on their heads in the second frame there. Um, and then what happens after a little while of that is the instruction seat is taken away, so you've got to do it all by memory. Uh, this is all played in silence, by the way, it's an important detail. Um, and you can see in the, sec in the, the middle frame there um, that then we switch people around from one table to another table. Um, and so suddenly you've got somebody who's been on the blue table, on the orange table, and what they don't know is that the instructions are now different. Base A that was hand on head is now something completely different in terms of an action. So the, they've entered a new culture, and that's what the game's about. It's about the difficulties of 
a culture and a, entering a new culture where things are different and unspoken rules, but you're experiencing it directly. You know, you're, you're going there, having that experience where everything you were doing at the last table was working, the rules have changed, and suddenly you're losing. Suddenly you're losing tokens, you're you know, feeling that you're doing things wrong, um, unless the people at your new table help you out. Uh, and if they do, if they help you out and help you to understand the rules, then you can compete fairly um, and everyone has a good time and you don't lose all your tokens. Um, and there's all kinds of great debrief and discussion that can come out of that. Again, uh, not something that I have any shares in, but culturally I, I strongly recommend. Um, but I do think what it uh, shows to me is that less than a failure. You, know? you could have told someone how difficult it was to uh, enter a new culture and to have to learn new ways to do things, but for them to actually feel the kind of failure of it um, really, I think, helps them to learn. So uh, in terms of the kind of uh, that, that one, in terms of how do we implement that one, for me, there's almost a kind of channeling Elsa uh, doing it. We've got to kind of let it go. We've got to uh, not be like that parent that does that wants to protect their children. We've got to not protect our learners from failure because we might be protecting them from learning and growing. And I do think that's something that uh, as kind of trainers, as uh, learning designers, whatever we're doing, uh, we sometimes might feel that we always want people to feel positively about what they're doing and yeah we don't want them to get really disheartened but that failure might be uh, okay to, to to set a space for a safe space for and to encourage the possibility that it will probably happen and that's what games do and tend to do well so uh working through these uh just got a couple more left and for our penultimate uh lever of games based learning i just want to give you uh Possibly the most iconic choice in film history, uh, which is from the film The Matrix, where Neo was offered the choice of the red pill, which was all about uh, waking up and seeing the world as it really was, or the blue pill, which is all around blissful ignorance. And the reason that it's such an iconic choice is because it's a meaningful choice, because it really a lot was at stake. Um, it was a choice about values, uh, and it was a very difficult choice. And I think that's the kind of choice that really good games uh, tend to give us. Um, and certainly, for example, if we think about different kinds of games, uh, board games as a kind of uh, as a hobby, as a discipline, some of the games that, that people really, really uh, like and really, really buy into are the ones that give the best kinds of choices. Um, so in games-based learning, I think we can give really complex, really interesting choices and choices with consequence. So just to give you a few examples, and this is trying to kind of Give you a concept level what the choice might be um, you could be talking about the choice between high risk high reward is one option that they have within this kind of game or slow and steady so you know do i going back to your stock market example if you like you know do i go with the high risk stocks or do i go with the ones that are a little bit more of a guaranteed payout as i go through these choices by the way again it would be great to hear if you've come across any of these in games yourselves uh you know so uh, if, you, if one of these choices in particular is something you want to call out a, 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 a resonance with then please do um or you could give learners a choice between discovery going out there and discovering new uh things new territories new options whatever or consolidating what you have building up your team or, or your, your holdings uh, in whatever scenario you're in or it could be about the difference between specialization getting really really good at one thing or expanding your range and expanding your variety and trying to be uh, able to have a, have a lot of different capacities or it could be a choice between what you instinctively feel and what logic and pragmatism tells you in a given situation and these are all examples i think of choices that, that happen in games uh, they, some of these happen in visible value and some of them happen in, in the, the big example that i'll, I'll bring in at the end um, but I think also uh, they're ones that we could implement in, in any kind of really simple uh, scenario based thing that we do. I mean, uh, you already talked, uh, Gavin, about scenarios, about e-learning. Um, and I think this is, the, this is actually the example I was going to give, but I was going to give a, uh, a bad example in this, in the, for this principle because I think we've probably all come across mandatory e-learning with choices like this. And this is not a meaningful choice. Uh, this is obvious where we want to go um, and it's not really going to contribute to very much but the most boring learning um, but actually my, I might if, if it's okay Gavin I might just come back to you in terms of what you're saying about this uh, yeah I agree um, the, the, the uh, I can't remember the name of it now uh, is it, uh, do you want to come up and mute there Gavin and tell me the, what the name of the 
Unit nine, that was it. Yeah. Um, so what was it about? What's it? What? It, what's different about the choices in unit nine, for instance, to the choice that we've got on the screen there? For you. Uh, what I like about the unit nine one is that the, I guess, very much the, the point that I think you, you're making here is that the, the answer or the options, I should say, the choices available are not necessarily obvious, and it's they're quite realistic as well. Like this one here, you know, it, a little bit of common sense knows that it's going to be A, right? And it's so it's really it's not really challenging as you as you were saying earlier. Whereas in the real talk about suicide one, for example, and even the lifesaver. Um, it presents re options that anybody could and, and indeed would choose. So that's the big point. Yeah, absolutely. So a little bit more complexity, a little bit more nuance, uh, and yeah, really challenging people. And yeah, as Alison says there, it's all about consequences. Absolutely. You know, what are the consequences? Which is if your choices don't have any consequences, then you know, was it really a choice at all? Um, and I think that's how we can start to implement this one as well, is we can start to think about how we can do better than that. And we can do better than that by thinking about choices that we can give people that might uh, definitely mirror real life choices, which we just saw there. Um, consequences, what are the consequences of the choices and making them feel that there will be consequences and that are difficult. Um, and the options being plausible or viable yeah, in the, uh, the, the ignore it and hope it will go away one, it's pretty obvious that it's not a viable choice. Uh, or choices that are interesting choices that have a little bit to them a little bit depth um, and perhaps that speak to things that people care about and think about values strategy kind of opposites that, that don't have an easy answer uh dilemmas exactly as you're saying burned definitely you know uh it, it, the, the the definition of a dilemma and the reason we have the choice kind of a horn the horns of a dilemma uh the classic one would be an ethical dilemma where you know you, you don't have a good option you're going to hurt somebody or uh, or have a, a problem on either side and your choice is to play those two problems or issues off against each other and decide which you value. You know, the trolley problem is, uh, has generated many memes recently, uh, and that's a, that's a classic one. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, offering our learners meaningful choices. Um, and again, just to go back to some of the things that you've talked about there, uh, you know, you can go, go back to all the games that really engage people, and there's some really meaningful choices in those. If we look at uh, you know, uh, consequences, you can choose exactly what you want to do. Uh, games, particularly complex ones like Age of Empires or Risk, uh, you know, you've got to choose what you're going to do. Even if it's uh, a classically simple game like chess or Wordle, you've got choices and they make, uh, you know, they, they, they come out with different consequences. So, absolutely. Good stuff. So, um, just got one final uh, lever to look at, uh, which is uh, where I think if you were thinking about those two things that we started talking about, games based learning and also gamification, and I will. As, as one of my final things, just, just make it really distinct what the difference is. I think we don't need to worry too much about the difference, actually. But um, I think if you're thinking of what is normally thought of as gamification, then it's a lot of what is kind of associated with this final lever, which is nudge learners towards behaviors that we want. Um, and you know, you can see on, the, on the, the image that I've chosen here, this is nudging these people towards the behavior that uh, the designers wanted, which is to use the stairs rather than the escalator by making them musical stairs. And this is what nudges are all about. And this isn't a game as such, but it's using a game uh, based concept, a playful idea. And there's this really strong tie, I think, between kind of behavioral nudges and games. And I think part of the reason for that is that games have really powerful selection pressures at work um, and really stark measures. A game gets played or it doesn't, it survives the test of time or it doesn't. Um, if you've got games where you can measure things like video games, players either click an option or they don't. And you can see exactly how many players ever click that option versus how many didn't. So there's this real kind of selection environment where some things just die off because they don't work and they don't engage people and some things really do engage people and those are the things that survive and get replicated just like in a real selection environment because other games emulate them. Um, so there's this really strong tie of something that nudges the right behaviors, the behaviors that get people engaged and playing, um, it survives and it, and it makes its way out into the world. Um, and uh, you know, just use this as an, as an illustration. So this is one of my favorite decks of cards for you card deck fans out there. Of uh, it's called Cogloads uh, Nuggets deck, um, but it just takes all of those little individual nuggets, like the IKEA effect. There's one particular behavioral nugget about if we build something ourselves, we tend to value it more. For instance, so it's a card deck of those kind of things. But whether you're thinking of a card deck, or whether you have a list, or, or a book like um, 
you know, Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, all these kind of behavioral nudges towards one thing rather than another. Um, and uh, if you think about these kind of things in games, you're often ending up with things like points is an obvious one, or uh, badges and achievements or leaderboards. Now, those things can be used well or badly, and I'm definitely happy to have a bit of a discussion about that. Um, but I just want to give you one example where I think they were used quite well. So uh, Lee Sheldon, a college lecturer in the US, and he came up with a system called the multiplayer classroom. He looked at the way that grades were often used, and he said, this is a bit demotivating. You know, you've got this perfect A that you're trying to aim for, and you only get it if your assignment or your exam is perfect. And what we're going to do is every imperfection, we're going to just shave a little bit off that grade and demotivate you. And so you've got that wrong, that wrong, and that wrong, so you get a B, and so on and so forth. They said it, this really, uh, in terms of behavioral nudges, what it nudges people towards is cramming for tests and always asking for everything, will this be on the test? And not caring about anything that isn't. Um, so he said, this isn't what I want. This isn't what I want to teach. And he wanted to nudge other behaviors. So he said, well, let's start you with an F. So he actually did it in quite a theatrical flourish. He said uh, to his students on the first day of semester, uh, right, you've all, you've all got Fs, but you can improve on that. And the way you can improve on that is by earning points. And you're going to get points for different things. And some of them are here, and you can see them, and you can aim towards them. And some of them I might award ad hoc based on how you surprise me with relevant things. Um, but it's giving people a, a, a behavioral motivator to nudge them towards anything that shows that they've learned things that are on the syllabus. Um, so there's all kinds of extra bits and pieces around that, and that framework allowed them to develop all kinds of individual nudges. But that basic framework is about yeah, nudging the people playing this kind of, kind of a game, kind of a gamified system, if you like, um, but moving it from this really traditional way of doing it to something a bit more playful. Um, if you're wondering about how to use that, there's a lot of gamification frameworks and frameworks about nudges around. Uh, one of my favorite is the Octalysis framework, uh, which is developed by Yukai Chow, uh, and that divides up the nudges that people get within games uh, into eight different categories. And you can see on the screen there just a whole range of different uh, ways those eight categories play out in games, but then also get used in all kinds of other things that are not game. Um, if that sounds interesting and you don't already know about uh, Yukai Chow and Octalysis, I would recommend checking them out. Um, his book, Actionable Gamification, is a really, really easy uh, entry point into that whole kind of area um, and gives lots and lots of examples of these kind of things being moved out of the game world and into the worlds of learning and other things as well. Um, but yeah, looking at what nudges behaviors and including that in our games-based learning or just taking it out of the games-based learning uh, kind of field and into whatever it is that we're doing. Um, to see if there's anything in the, in the examples there, actually, we've already talked about that, I think. And feel free to, to jump in as, again here. If you can see examples, if you want to add examples of where you see nudges really work in games-based learning or anything approaching it. Um, I think even those win states of, you know, going up a ladder and snakes and ladder, you know, you can think of as, oh, I want to get there again. Um, or I'm certain that in learning to code in Unity, there's lots of things about making that work that feel really good and nudge you towards wanting to do again. Um, and Wordle definitely has some really good uh, things like that about being able to share it and have social sharing on Wordle that then nudges people towards saying, what is that? What is that little grid of yellow and green things that you've just shared and why should I? Uh, oh, let's check it out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's definitely some examples of that about. Excellent. Okay, so uh, that actually is our six. That's the six things that I uh, categorized, all the things that I saw working in games and, and coming across games-based learning, uh, saw, them, saw them in action. So I'd like to, to spend a little bit of time now, so uh, just kind of summarizing there, but I'd like to spend a little bit of time now uh, kind of bringing them together and getting you a little bit more involved as well. Uh, but we're saying, Games work, and that was our, our fulcrum, wasn't it? Uh, uh, learning, when we use games in learning, we put the learner at center, we let learners explore, we let learners fail, we set learners an open challenge, we give them meaningful choices, and we nudge them towards the behaviors that we want. Um, so actually, um, just thinking about, yeah. Yeah, just, just give us the one chance to put these in action with, uh, with an example that I'll give you. And then we'll just branch out into thinking about how you might use them for your own stuff. 
Uh, really interesting comment from Gavin there. Um, I tend to agree that Monopoly has problems as a game. It is also very popular, which is, creates an interesting kind of dilemma. If we get time, we can explore that dilemma. Um, but yeah. Um, OK, good. So um, I'm going to talk to you a little tiny bit about a game called uh, Evive, which is a learning game, uh, which uh, I facilitate sometimes. Again, it's not a game that I designed, but it's a game that I facilitated quite a bit. And it's uh, for uh, it's kind of intended for corporate learning. Um, as I'm talking about it, just what I want you to have a little think about is of the things we've talked about, which of those can you, which of those do you think it's doing? And don't, you don't need to wait for me to finish talking. By all means, just pop into the chat if you think, oh yeah, that is actually doing some of the things that we've talked about there. That what he's talking about is putting the learner at center. It's letting people explore, whatever you think you can hear. So uh, oh, let me know if anybody has played this game, by the way. Uh, but Evive is a game played on a mobile app. Um, but also the participants who are playing as a team are on a Zoom call. So you're on a Zoom call, but you're playing the game as an individual player on your app and communicating with your teammates over Zoom. Um, and on your app, you've got uh, this kind of map here. And the challenge that you're faced with is that you, uh, this is a scenario, it's kind of a little bit of a sci-fi scenario where Earth is under threat and you have to evolve as a species in order to meet this threat. And the way you evolve is, first of all, by exploring and uh, choosing resources and prioritizing which resources you think you want to develop. Um, and then when you've harvested these different, uh, you know, you harvest what you get from the forest or from the lake or from the plain, um, as a team, you know, individual players are taking actions to harvest these things. Uh, but then um, when you've harvested these things, you can trade in the fruits of your forest or of your plane, et cetera, and get more and more credits, which can build up towards more and more scientific research to help you evolve um, and to help you mine the essential minerals you need for this process as well. So there's a kind of game going on, and it's very much like some commercial games, but play it as a team. Uh, there's a big emphasis on how are we going to decide how to work, whose roles, who's going to take which role within the game. Um, who's going to, uh, is there going to be a leader? Do we need a leader? What's our strategy? Um, and depending on those choices that you make as a team, depending on how you communicate, will depend on how well you progress against the clock. Because if you don't evolve by the time you get to the end of the, the, the allocated time, um, then you lose. Um, so that's a basic description. Happy to answer questions on it as well or, or repeat anything. But in the chat or out loud, Anything you hear there from what I've described to you that's perhaps suggesting to you that it's doing some of that? Yeah, man, see that you're exploring, absolutely. And there are some meaningful choices, you know. You can decide to focus on one resource, so you can spread yourself wide. Absolutely, you can. And there is a challenge, yeah. You are working towards something. It is definitely possible to fail. It's a very delicate balance, and I've done some uh, debriefs with groups that have failed, and there's been a little bit of kind of tension in the air, absolutely. Um, but if those debriefs, I think, are handled quite well, then you can help people to learn from that and you can definitely set it up so they're going to get that second chance to play. And there is an open challenge. You're evolving. Yeah, uh, you're managing resources. You're collaborating, which uh, is, and this is where I think this is an interesting example, because uh, if we think about what we said at the start, it's, yeah, we can learn, but are we learning the right thing? And actually here we're learning about collaboration, particularly if we debrief it well on collaboration. Um, and learning to repeat the things that we did well in collaborating and to, to not do the things that caused us to, to, to get a bad result. Um, good. Yeah, and it's a good point, Ben. There's not necessarily a, a hierarchy of these, really. Yeah. So I just wanted to share that example of perhaps one in action uh, and where it can, can kind of uh, happen. Really happy to open it out now a little bit and invite you to uh, perhaps... Oh, sorry. Uh, what about you? Uh, maybe you've got something you would like to share now or talk about in terms of uh, a question. How could I use the levers with this thing that I'm doing? Maybe you've got an insight already. Maybe you think, actually, I think I could use the levers with this. Um, or perhaps you've got a, uh, an example that you want to share. I can already see, I think, the levers in action with this experience or this game or this learning that I'm involved with or, or I've seen. So yeah, invite you to ask, to chat, to uh, come off mute, or just pop your thoughts into the chat. 
Um, that is amazing. Thank you. It was super interesting. I have actually a question. I hope it is not too much uh, high level, uh, okay. but I'm, I'm too curious. Um, in all these years of experience, did you actually, uh, do you have any idea or did you build actually an idea of why um, gamification has such a positive correlation with memory? So why uh, when we actually play, mm -hmm. we learn so, so much and why this actually stick with memory? Why do, do, do you actually have uh, a better understanding? Yeah, I think for me, that goes back to that, to the very first of those levers. And that's in a way why it's the first is that when you're at the center and you're doing and taking action, you know, you've got to process what you're doing at a much deeper level. And, and when you're doing things like making meaningful choices, you've got to process it at a much more meaningful level. You know, um, when I, you know, I remember uh, I used to sit in, uh, I'm making myself sound like a really bad student now when I was at school, but I used to sit in French lessons and I used to not listen at all. But uh, if the teacher said, Terry, what did I just say? Um, I used to be able to repeat back exactly what she just said because I didn't have to process it at a particularly deep level. But if I'd have been having to actually have a conversation in French and do things, you know, um, then yeah, I wouldn't have been able to do that. Ben, I think Thank you wanted to jump in there. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to react to Giuseppe. Uh, I think that emotions are very important as well because mm. we're emotionally engaged and involved and that kind of engages different parts of your brain. So it's not the, uh, the executive functions of the brain. It's more the, uh, you know, learning by doing as yeah. uh, the way children learn. So yeah. that's probably why it sticks better. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, Bernd. Yeah, our emotions are in play. That's another reason to, it's another reason to connect things to, isn't it? It's, it's, we've got more things that we're connecting that memory mm. to. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Lee, you've got your hand up there. Yeah, um, I just want to say I've thank you so much. I found this really helpful and everyone's um, links to various things. I've literally just started working for a games company um, and had very limited exposure to games and gaming and gamification. So I found this really, really helpful. So thank you very much for everybody who's put all of their links and stuff. I'm going to take a closer look at them so I can understand um, certainly my demographic a little bit more going forward um, and how I can potentially build some of that into our new L&D offerings so fantastic yeah Brilliant. great stuff thanks no problem at all I'd be very interested to connect and hear more a little bit more about your uh, your games company as well yeah sure I'm uh, in the yeah, L&D shakers community so perfect. on LinkedIn and I think, and I think Giuseppe's going to share my details at the end as well no right. yeah, there we go now uh, perfect. Thank you, Lee. Uh, I've just seen a couple of questions in the chat as well there. Hannah's saying, should we always aim to include at least one of the levers when authoring training? Um, I mean, if I, certainly if you're, uh, if you're going for a games-based approach or you're looking to learn from the power of games and include that in what you're doing, I would say yes. I mean, this is what I have distilled my observations of why games work and why learning games work uh, into. Um, I think for, for me, the way you can start to use them is, is almost... So, so we've got that phrasing of them as uh, when we use learning games, we do this and we do that. But also you can look at it as an imperative or, uh, you know, do this, do more of this, uh, you know, put the learner at the center as an imperative. Um, and I think you can also ask yourself the question, am I doing enough of that? And that's a question you can answer for yourself. You know, am I doing enough of giving them meaningful choices? Am I uh, letting them um, suffer the consequence of those choices? You know, those kind of things. So I think that's helpful there, uh, Hannah. Um, there's something else in there. Oh, yeah, Giuseppe mentioned about repetition, which I think is a, is a great point. Um, someone else with a raised hand there. Steffi, did you want to jump in? Yes, Terry, thank you. This was amazing. Um, one question. What do you think makes for a good debrief when it comes to games? What are some characteristics of a good debrief? Really good question, yeah. Um, I mean, for a debrief, I think um, you want to focus on what's going to help people to take things away. I think debrief should really be about helping them to process what they've experienced and turn it into, uh, you know, if you think about classic kind of models of learning, like Kolb's cycle of learning, you know, something like that. Uh, it says we have an experience and then we reflect on it and we form rules about how to do things in the world. So the, the debrief is about asking questions for me 
um, that do that, that help them think, what just happened? What can I learn from it? How does it relate to my real job and my real challenges? And it could be as simple as those questions, just as I've outlined them there, or something more specific to the situation that helps them think through that. But yeah, that's, that's what I tend to focus on. Thank you. Just trying to keep up with the chat here as well. Um, yeah, Penny, definitely that deeper level is really good. Um, requirements for assessment are proof for learning, but expectations of pedagogy is that's what people understand. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a challenge. Yeah. It does take longer. Absolutely. Uh, I think, you know, it's important to acknowledge, I think, some of those uh, disadvantages or uh, limitations or dip difficulties. Uh, it takes longer. You've got less control. People might do things you don't expect. If you give them freedom, they might, they might take it and, you, and run with it. Um, but I think those are small prices to pay. But yeah, sometimes you have to persuade directors and stakeholders and investors uh, the same thing. And there's a lot of evidence around there for games-based learning, particularly if you, want, if you want to kind of get a little bit of ammunition there about uh, the, the kind of effectiveness. Uh, there's some really good sources through Jane McGonigal has a lot of research that she's catalogued on, on her page on her website, Jane McGonigal. Um, and Carl Cap is really good for that as well. Carl Cap has a lot of articles uh, cataloging and bringing together proof of the effectiveness of game-based learning. Uh, Yukai Chow, uh, who I mentioned earlier, is also really good on the gamification side for that, and it's got lots of really uh, ROI-based case studies on the effectiveness of gamification. Uh, gamification workshops, says Julius, exploration takes time. We're always tight on that. Any hacks? Um, yeah, I think for me, probably the only hack is to get really familiar with those frameworks. I mean, that's, that's what helps, I think, you're not having to reinvent the wheel. So, uh, you know, the Octalysis framework, uh, I think, is a good one. Uh, you can also check out uh, Gamified UK is a good website for inspiration of different ways to do it. Uh, but for me, it's about getting familiar with those as kind of tools or a toolkit um, so that instead of having to reinvent the wheel each time, you can say, oh, we'll slot this in. Uh, and Emilia's got there, and I think we're going to have to round up in a second, but I'll just go with Emilia's perhaps. Uh, if you don't have an opportunity to do a debrief, how do you measure the effectiveness of the training game? It's an interesting question, Emilia. I mean, I think for me that would go back to how we'd measure the effectiveness of any learning experience. For me, the debrief isn't necessarily primarily, like I was just saying to Steffi, about um, measurement. It's more about facilitating the learning sticking uh, and translating into to a real world practice. Um, but you can certainly include evaluative questions in there. Um, I think for me, you know, the traditional ways of, uh, effect, of measuring effectiveness of learning apply just as much to games-based learning. So has it changed people's behaviors? Has it changed their ability to make their targets? Um, at surface level, did they enjoy it? And do they think it helped them? Um, those kind of things. Uh, but yeah, I think we are getting to the end of the time. So uh, have we got enough time uh, for me to just round up with uh, just one tiny thing? Perhaps? Please, absolutely. Perfect. Um, but thank you for getting involved in the discussion. I think it's a really great discussion, but I will definitely be saving the chat and, and exploring some of your links. Um, and I think as well as the link that uh, um, uh, Giuseppe has also already shared, uh, if you are interested in more content or, um, or more uh, ideas from me, then uh, as well as my LinkedIn, as well as being free to um, Connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, my website there. Uh, there we go. Just have to shared it as well. Sorry. Um, you can sign up to my mailing list and check out some of the other things that I'm doing, like my blog. Um, I'll just very briefly, so a couple of optional slides. Very briefly mention that uh, if you were wanting a tool, a toolkit uh, for doing some of the kinds of things, it's not based on the six levers specifically, but it is on about making uh, content more interactive and engaging with some game-based principles. Uh, then I've got a product on my website called the Transform Deck, which is all about inspiring yourself to do that yourself in your own learning design. But I'll just mention that as a little throwaway there. Uh, if you are interested, I'd love to connect, love to continue the conversation. Uh, and, and that's me. Thank you very much for, for coming along and for getting involved in the discussion. And look forward to speaking to some of you on the, uh, on the Slack as well. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Terry. And I will share again the records of this session on LinkedIn and the Shakers community uh, website as well. So, yeah, it was a really an amazing pleasure. Uh, let's keep uh, learning together and be connected. Brilliant. And thank you, Giuseppe. Have an amazing day. Bye, guys. Yes. Bye. Have an amazing evening.
Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. See ya.